Hi, I'm Rich Zeiger. I'm pastor of Real Life Community Church in Three Oaks, Michigan, and a member of the River Valley Ministerial Association, uh, bringing a devotion for the fourth week of Lent in 2022. Uh, I'm going to begin with Psalm 32. Uh, I'll be reading from the New International Version, 1984 edition. David writes, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped, as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble with, and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. <clears throat> Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. As David writes this psalm, for us. He is celebrating the joys of having your sins removed, having God no longer count them against your record. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. There is a joy, there is a blessing here, and he ends the psalm uh, celebrating this as as he is dialoguing here with God, and, and part of it is him speaking to God, and he appears to um, have uh, the Lord speaking back in the latter part of the psalm. And then in verse 11, he says, Rejoice in the Lord as he speaks to the people, and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. It is fitting and right that we should celebrate the removal of our sins. And as we Celebrate Lent, it's it's an ironic almost term as we talk about celebration and yet fasting and, and separating ourselves during this time, this season of preparation. But it is a celebration. We are remembering what sacrifice the Lord made for us as we prepare our hearts to celebrate Passion Week and especially to celebrate the Resurrection on Resurrection Sunday. And everything that we do in the process of, of preparing our hearts is because of the fact that Christ, in his sacrifice for us, has removed our sin. And so our sin has been credited to his account. It's on his tab, and he takes it to the cross and pays our penalty. His righteousness, conversely, is credited to us. And Paul in Romans 4 uses this same psalm to communicate that, that just as Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness, so for us, we are credited with Christ's righteousness and our sins are no longer on our account. There's a heaviness when we harbor sin when we leave it unconfessed in our lives, it it saps our strength, it takes away our blessing. This is also a picture of what would happen in Israel as Israel would sin against God and not turn from their sin and God would withhold his blessing. And yet it's his heart to forgive, his joy to pour out blessing on his people. And we see this as David acknowledges his sin to the Lord. And he says, I, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. He 
sees the character of God. David knows that God is compassionate and faithful in his love, and he wants to, to show mercy. If we will just own up to our sin and trust in him. And so when we do this, we see that God is the one who does the work. The repentance isn't our activity. It's something that we do in response to God. It's We're, we're not causative in the removal of the sin. It's from him. He does it. He removes it. In the same way that he removed the reproach of Egypt from his people Israel, we see in Joshua chapter 5, which is in the uh, Revised Common Lectionary, the Old Testament reading. And we see in Joshua chapter 5, starting in, in verse 9, that the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the place had been called has been called Gilgal to this day, which appears to mean uh, something along the line of to roll. But this takes place between the uh, the events of the crossing of the Jordan when God miraculously stops up the river and the uh, the fall of Jericho, which would come shortly after. And in the meantime, God calls Joshua to circumcise the nation again. Those who had been circumcised in Egypt had fallen in the desert, and a new generation now would be taking the land. And as they set themselves apart for God by this sign of the covenant, God is saying, I remove the reproach of the past. Interestingly, the uh, the gospel reading for today or for this, uh, this week comes from uh, Luke chapter 15, a familiar parable, the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son. We have these... Uh, these parables grouped together of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son in, in the book of Luke. And we're familiar with those, so I, I won't read the passage for us entirely, but it's important for us to recognize that the, the prodigal son story, as we talk about it, really isn't about the son. And the parable about the sheep and the coin aren't really about the sheep or the coin. They're about the father's attitude toward those who are lost in sin, who are enslaved, who are far from him. We know this because he, he begins, uh, Luke begins his account by saying in, in verses 1 to 3 or verses 1 and 2, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, to hear Jesus, that is. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They're grumbling, complaining about the fact that Jesus is spending his time with those people. Then Jesus told them this parable. This seems to be the point. He tells these parables in relation to their attitude towards sinners. And the, the point in each of these parables, and specifically in this parable of the lost son, is that the father rejoices. He delights in forgiving us. He delights in welcoming us back. His heart is not held back from us like the older brother in the prodigal son story. No, the father runs, he comes running to, to the penitent son who has been away and has sinned against him and neglected to, to show any gratitude. But the father rejoices and celebrates his return. The the idea behind this is that God's joy, his delight is to remove our sin and show us mercy. Our response to that must be not only to celebrate with gratitude, but to tell others. And I'll close with this last thought from 2 Corinthians 5. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. There's this crediting again. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. 
We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the joy of salvation that we share, that we have been saved because Christ removed our sin and we are credited with his righteousness. Now let's go tell the world about it.